to go to university to um to 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 get involved in in everything that's available there including activism um because to some extent i think my generation hasn't made the best fist of the planet um and, and i'm rather ashamed of that which is one of the reasons i'm trying to be active now but but you know the, the world is yours to to win and and recreate and it's it's never been more important Wonderful. Thank you, Shemi. And the other thing just to say to students on the call too is that Shemi has done a lot on um, issues which affect people abroad because part of the role in Parliament is to talk about refugees, is to talk about people who are in countries where their human rights are not being observed. And so if in the question you have anything relating to issues abroad, or you may have family who live abroad, you're worried that you know their, their rights are not covered, what can the British Parliament do? Please, um, we've got lots of people on this call who can answer questions. So we've still got Diane and Lord Harris. So Diane, over to you to talk about um, What's, what do you feel young people who are interested in politics should be thinking about? Um, we know that there's just been a book that's come out, um, a biography of your experience with some very interesting photographs which were in the press, which showed you to be the only black student amongst um, others when you went off to university. What reflections do you have? Um, and after a life of sort of activism um, and you're still being active and still being political and, and um, campaigning, what do you think for young London students? What, what, what's your thinking at the moment? Thank, thank you very much, Catherine. Can you hear me? Um, the first thing I would say is that a politics isn't just party politics. It isn't even party politics. Politics is about your values and how you lead your life. So it's not about thinking, oh, I'm going to be a student, I'm going to be joined one party or another, and I'm going to build a career in politics. No, it's about what are my values? How do I live my life? And what sort of ally and supporter and just encouraging kind of person am I to other people? And we're in a very difficult time. We have, and Catherine will forgive me if I say something, read about the Tories, we have a, a particularly right-wing English nationalist government. I mean, there's some nonsense legislation coming up this week about freedom of speech in universities, and the government's promoting this merely to make the case that people should be allowed to say whatever racist and fascist things they like on university campuses. The thing that strikes me, though, has been the response to the English football team and the Euro championships. And um, I, I mean, I'm not really a football person, but I have followed um, the Euros because it's such a, an important moment. And I'm afraid I was really saddened and shocked by the fact that that team, having got us so far and literally within minutes, you know, with the penalties of actually winning the Euros, um, they faced, a just an outpouring of racist abuse online at the three young men who happened to be black who came up and didn't quite come through with the penalties. And what it shows you is that underneath all the gush about multiculturalism and so on, there's something really unpleasant under the surface. And I think we need to challenge that unpleasantness, whether it's amongst family or people we know, or as university students, within organizations. This is 2021. This country has to move forward. It has to move forward in a globalized world, in a country which is more actually globalized and international than ever. And we have to fight the kind of xenophobia and racism we've seen demonstrated in the response by some people to the results of the Euros. Um, I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you, Diane. Um, now, our final speaker before we go to questions is Toby Harris. He doesn't like being called Lord, but he is actually quite well known in Haringey as the former council leader of Haringey Borough. And obviously, therefore, knows all about everything from potholes to adult social care to, um, you know, housing provision for asylum seekers to 
being a landlord of many, many people as the former um, lead of um, Haringey Housing um, and a number of other really practical things. But also when he went on to the GLA, did a lot on policing. And I wonder whether, um, Toby, you could talk a little bit about the current bill going through Parliament, which is currently in the Lords, I believe, for the policing crime and um, punishment. <laughs> very Tory sounding bill um, and just what you think the practical on the ground implications are because I think for a lot of young people on the call and certainly as a constituency MP I am just really distressed by the number of young people who do not feel safe um, and the number of young people who are caught up in quite violent circumstances um, and I'm just wondering you know how do we kind of connect perhaps what we've heard on the call today but with the bill that's going through Parliament so that we can really have an impact as Labour people in Parliament. Okay, thanks very much, um, Catherine. Uh, very kind of you to build up my uh, previous uh, uh, leadership of Harrogate Council. I should just point out that I was leader of Harrogate Council. I stopped being leader 22 years ago, which may be before most of the people on this call were actually born. So whatever knowledge I have about that is a little bit uh, out of date. I think it's been very interesting listening to um, um, colleagues talking about their motivations and, and, and so on, um, and how they got into the sort of political world. I think one of the things that always strikes me is that there is a distinction, it certainly applies in politics, but actually if you look in other professions as well, you see the same thing. There's a distinction between people who want to be something and those who want to do something. And I think that's very important. Um, there are people who want the status of being, I don't know, a barrister or a doctor or a politician, an MP or whatever else it might be. And there are those who are interested in that role because of what they can achieve and what they can make happen for other people. And I think particularly those of us in the Labour Party, this is all about what we can achieve for everyone, particularly those people who face disadvantage, uh, who face difficulties, who are discriminated against, or whatever else it wants to be. And I think that's one of the things that's must, that has to underpin um, what we're all um, uh, trying to do. Catherine's mentioned the local and, 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 and Haringey and so on. And one of the things that's very clear to me is that local politics really matters. National politics gets all the headlines. National politics can set a, can set a framework. But in terms of practical delivery at the local level, it's what you can do um, at a local level. And even in a very hostile, difficult national framework, you can make things happen, you can defend things, you can uh, protect things. And that's certainly one of the things I was very conscious of um, in my time as a council leader when there were a lot of challenges facing us, probably um, probably less than what are being faced by local authorities now, but that's the context in which it happens. Um, Catherine's mentioned my involvement in policing. I was for four years chair of the Metropolitan Police Authority, as it then was, which is responsible for oversight, uh, the strategy, and yet holding the Metropolitan Police to account. Um, and I then spent eight years fulfilling a similar role in terms of counter-terrorism um, and police work on counter-terrorism. And none of these are easy issues, but the important point is that we all need the police at certain times in our lives. We need them in a terrorist incident. Uh, we need them if we're attacked. We need them if um, uh, the, uh, uh, we're burgled, lose stuff or whatever else it might be. But what is critical is because the police have all those extra powers, they have the power to stop people, to search people, uh, to arrest them, um, and to get them charged, that the police are accountable for that, that they are answerable for the way they use those decisions. We looked last night, and one of the questions I would be asking if I was currently responsible for policing in London is what went wrong at the barriers in Wembley, which meant that people could break in to Wembley Stadium. Now, that was people who just wanted to watch the match. 
that actually it could have been a terrorist. It could have been somebody else trying to get in there. So something clearly went wrong. And the police have to be answerable for that, not just throw the book at them every time uh, an individual police officer gets something wrong. That's a matter which you want them to pursue. But it's about that process of public accountability. And the only way that the police can be effective is if they have public support. If I mean, we in this country, we talk about policing by consent. And that means that the public must feel the police are for them rather than against them. And I have to say, I have never spoken to an audience of young people who immediately say, oh, the police are for me. They nearly always tell me that they find the police oppressive and their attitude towards them um, intrusive, uh, unpleasant, discriminatory, and so on. Now, you may be a very different group of young people, but I think that demonstrates that how important it is that the police work to build support in the community, from all parts of the community, from different minority communities within the broader community, with young people, for that matter with older people, um, uh, L LGBT people, whatever it may be, it's essential that the police are seen to be there for them and are accountable for what they do. And that was something that um, when I was in the police authority, we tried very hard to try and create with forums on stop and search, addressing some of the other difficult issues. And that's something that I think is going to become increasingly important in the future. And Catherine mentions the bill, which uh, has just left the House of Commons and is uh, winging its way to the House of Lords. This is a Christmas tree bill. It's got all sorts of stuff in it, some of which actually makes a degree of sense and some of which is deeply discriminatory or raises all sorts of red flags, particularly if you don't have a police service which sees itself as answerable and accountable to the public. But there is a game being played. Um, Diane mentioned it um, and, and Ray's mentioned it, which the government is doing all the time, that they present pieces of legislation. And what they're trying to do, it's sort of dog whistle politics. They're saying, um, you either you back this in its entirety or you're against this thing and they try and position the Labour Party or those who are raising genuine concerns as being against the national, uh, against the tide of public opinion, against what we would all, all see to be right. And this is partly what this policing bill is all about. So the restrictions on protest, the restrictions on um, the way in which uh, people can, can demonstrate are all part of this process. Now, I believe that people should have the right to protest, the right to demonstrate. Okay, there have got to be some limitations in terms of the um, inconvenience that it causes other people, but that's part of what should happen. And the only way that works is when there is a proper dialogue at local level between those organising a protest and those responsible for policing it to make sure that it's managed in a sensible way whilst retaining that right. And what the government is trying to do is to create an additional dividing line behind that and saying that certain sorts of things are unacceptable. Whether or not you cause annoyance, well, actually with the best will in the world, uh, if you're demonstrating about something, you are going to annoy somebody. It's a question of what's the point when that crosses over to causing so, um, so much inconvenience, so much difficulty, that actually the police should say, no, hang on, could you do it over there rather than here? And I think that the government are trying to undermine that relationship between the police and the public. And it's more, more about demonstrating that they're tough on issues, tough on people they don't like, rather than genuinely uh, trying to resolve problems. And this is, again, part of the culture wars, which this government particularly enjoys, of trying to divide people rather than to bring them together. And I believe that the fundamental responsibility of all politicians is to try and make things happen, but to do so in a way in which you have public support and you bring people together. So I'm, I'm conscious I'm eating into the time for questions, so I will stop there. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Toby. And I think you laid out some of the dilemmas which are facing both MPs and um, peers around the bill in the um, going through Parliament at the moment. I wonder, I, I can't see any blue hands yet, but if everyone could go on to the participants at the bottom there, are little blue hands to ask questions. Could I ask, um, perhaps kicking off with Diane and then maybe Shami, Toby or even Ray um, and if Alex is still on the call just asking about the Sarah Everard um, issue because obviously for a lot of young, London young people but across the UK there was really an outpouring of just frustration anger that for many young women Sarah Everard was 33 I think but just this sense that even after all these years of campaigning it still doesn't feel safe to go out at night and obviously I think for those of us who've done constituency work for a long time, being attacked like that is actually quite rare because you are actually more likely to be attacked by someone you know, unfortunately. But just wondering where pe the panel feel we are at on women's rights, protecting women, um, and how that plays into the speeches that we've heard relating to the bill and some of the speeches that have been made outside Parliament by protesters. Um, Diane, would you like to kick off? Because I know you've you've got to leave before end of the session. Um, I'm on the what they call the Home Affairs Select Committee, which looks at home affairs issues like policing. And we're doing some work on this. I think one of the problems with keeping women safe is the under resourcing of policing in particular and the criminal justice system in general. And until this government is prepared to fund the police service in the way it should be, but also fund the, the prosecution and the courts and so on, anything they say about keeping women safe is just lip service. Okay, um, Toby and then Shami. Diane's absolutely right. Um, I mean, the government's make a big deal about the fact that it's it's um, providing and recruiting more police. Well, yeah, that's fine. All it's doing is replacing some of those police numbers that were reduced earlier in the life of this Conservative government. That's all that they're doing. And the reality is that the pressures on the police and everything else are rising all the time. The expectations are rising all the time. Um, and the danger is that when you spread a police service more thinly, either things get dropped off the bottom, and the danger is that that'll be about um, um, protecting women, um, or alternatively, that the quality of the policing, the policing by consent, goes by the window. Um, we've only got five minutes to deal with this. You have no choice. You must do what we're, what, what we're saying to the police officer rather than explaining it. And I think that's the danger that we're seeing with the way that um, the government's operating. So Sarah Everard case raises all sorts of issues, not the least of which was the perpetrator, how he got into the police, initially through the um, um, civil nuclear um, police service, but he was an armed officer who should have been subjected to greater vetting than other officers. How was that allowed to happen? Second question, if he was committing um, indecent exposure offences and so on and so forth, why on earth did those get shelved? Was this because, oh, he's one of ours? Mm. Now, those are all questions which, whether the substance to them or not, the police have got to answer and to explain and explain what their processes are. Because otherwise, people's confidence that they will take women's safety seriously is going to be seriously undermined. So it's a critical issue for the police to get that right. Very good point. Um, Shami, can you come in and then I will bring in um, Rebecca, Martha, Eleanor and Kay in that order because they that's how they appear on my screen. Um, so I won't repeat, um, I'll just agree with what colleagues have said about under resourcing from Diane and culture of potential cover up, which is something that Toby uh, rightly points up, which is which causes people huge concerns when it comes to policing. Um, but I but I would say there are really there are very serious structural problems with the whole criminal justice system and women and sex offences in particular. Um, and the uh, attrition rates, so the, um, 
the the, the rate of um, convictions compared to actual reported crimes in relation to um, in relation to sex offences in particular is a, is a real problem. A great deal of that is to do with resourcing because anything to do with consent um, is is going to require some very very sensitive investigation. Uh, and policing, particularly in a social media age, when people rightly want to look at communications between people and their social media posts and so on. But the bottom line is that um, resourcing is very political. Where you choose to, whether in the criminal justice system or in healthcare or anywhere else, where a government chooses to invest its resources, are, that's a hugely political decision. And some people will suffer if, um, and suffer catastrophically, whether it's black people, whether it's women, whether it's victims of particular crimes like sex offences. And under years of austerity, the justice system has been particularly underfunded from start to finish, from policing to the courts. Um, and women and people who are the victims of sex offences have, have, as a result, suffered the most. So you have this, on the one hand, this police bill that is supposed to be very, very tough, but is really, as Toby said, a dog whistle against Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter. Meanwhile, when it comes to people actually feeling safe, you've got this, this crisis. So it's almost Orwellian in that you say one thing, you you target people with your with your rhetoric, whether it's black football players or whether it's vulnerable women, you shut down their protests, but meanwhile, you leave them less safe because of the funding decisions that you've made over more than a decade. Thank you. Would Rebecca, Martha and Eleanor each